start hello yeah. good afternoon everyone and welcome back to the auditorium i am sneha hegel and i'm sharia and just for the session after the lunch today i want to start with the lunch because the talk the two talks that we coming right now are one is from biology and the other one is from uh, from radio astronomy which will be delivered by the director of our institute yes so without delaying further i'd like to introduce the speaker of our next talk uh, it's mr varun suresh he is a biologist from training he did his his masters from sis college of arts science and commerce which happens to be in mumbai itself and then he had a few research experiences in nirrh and he is working on brain he is trying to see how our brain develops and what are the uh, pathways that help in evolving our brains and today he will talk to us about some cool stuff about brain right from human brain to rodents brain and all the things that are out here how are you thank you very much Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Happy National Science Day! I hope you had a pleasant experience so far with all the lab visits in PRR, and you generally liked all the talks. If you had attended a few, uh, so my talk will be on learning the maps of the brain. So learning the maps of the brain, I'm going to talk you on the units of the cells that make up the brain in the first place. But I'm going to talk to you about the journey of research of brain development and function. That has been carried out by humans and scientists and colleagues of ours for the last few many decades. But in order to understand what it means to have the build, what it means to have building blocks of our brain, we need to first understand a few things about the history of the brain. That will be the first part of the talk. Then we will talk about the various brains of various species, because as it turns out, the only organisms that have a functioning Beautiful brain. Many others have them. Many other organisms also have them. We need to come up with a developing mouse brain in which I will present to you some part of our own work carried out here in Professor Shubhendra's lab at the IIT Park with a lot of other collaborators. And the last part, which is perhaps the part that each one of us in the audience is interested and in, a question that has been in humans since the very beginning of our ability to think, what makes us human special? Is it the human brain? Well, perhaps if you were asked Aristotle some years, 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 or millennia ago, he did not even think that the human brain was acting as a seat of all our ability to think. In fact, Aristotle thought that all the function, things that we are controlling is controlled by the heart, and the brain is just a radiator that keeps the body running. How long does Aristotle? Some time later, much, much, much later, in fact, in the second century, a Roman physician called Galen, along with his own research and findings, and along with many of the findings of various physicians from all across the world, concluded that he found the seed of human reasoning. He said that there are many differences that are important to understand. It's equally important to understand who is one of the few people who, the few people who tell us that it is actually. One of the most important things. Everyone knows this guy who drew this. This is a picture of him, his own self, and he, he, he thought his brain looked like this. He, I'm speaking about this, of course, Leonardo da Vinci. He was a scientist as well as an artist, just like the person who is this one who is named after him. But what da Vinci said when he used to the human colors, the human colors, and try to see the animals. He used to count them and see how each one's brain is built. He also figured out the way the brain is connected to various parts of our bodies, and then various other positions got an idea that each part of our brain is connected to the brain somehow. So that means the brain is the only part that could control the brain. And then what happened in California in 1848? An accident in which a rocket broke his head, went across his eye on the left side to be precise, and then jumped outside. Yet, after that incident, he survived. His name was Phineas Gage. You can see his left eye is closed. This one is 
passing through this. Well, I have a slight bonus for changing the mic. Just hold on with us. Okay. Okay. Better. Well, it's a nice time to break. You can actually see these beautiful drawings while we just take the mic. So, okay, we'll let you guys come in. So these drawings end up in all the neuroscience textbooks for one very, very important reason. It shows us various brains of all species or many species that they do this from, or especially humans, is made of cells that arborize, that make connections. Today we call these cells neurons. And at that point, when I was thinking that the whole body is made of cells, God thought these are not cells, these are special units of the brain. I and mean, we name the neurons, or other people name the neurons, but he thought these cells are different than the other cells. He was partially right, but mostly he was wrong. These are kinds of cells. And what we were able to see from the beautiful drawings was the fact that these cells come in various shapes and various sizes. And these are the cells that longitudinally are connect from, the, from your hands to your arms, to the spinal cord, and even in the brain. So this led us to one of the most important questions. That is the human brain any different than all the brains that are there in the world? And to do that, let's have a look at all of these brains. And we will count the number of neurons that are actually there in all of these brains. So if you take a mouse brain or a hamster brain, these weigh roughly half a gram to one gram, and they contain like 70 million neurons or 90 million neurons. And these are grown roughly to the size as you would see. So if you guys can take your hand and do the mouse brain like this, we can only sit on this much, okay? Now take a rat brain. A rat is slightly bigger than the mouse. So its brain is also slightly bigger. It is like almost two grams and contains 200 million neurons. Let's take another animal, which is a favorite of many, the guinea pig. Now you can see that this will slightly become bigger again. Yes, it's, that's why it's raised more than 40 million neurons. Now, we are small animals, right? Are we going to have big animals? Yeah, okay, let's go. Let's go slightly bigger. Pitching monkey. It's one of the whole world. 53 grams of brain. Now, look at the number of neurons. It's directly charged from 240 million almost to 5,000 million neurons. Okay, one of the Let's go bigger. Monkey monkey. Slightly bigger monkey. Almost 90 grams of brain with double the number of neurons than the last monkey that we saw. 6,376 million neurons. Okay, big brain. This is our brain. It is called, it almost weighs one and a half kilos for a normal human being, and it roughly contains 18 to 90,000 million neurons. So this led us to question, are all of these brains built in the same size? If they're made of different sizes, are they made in the same way? For people like us in TRR and across the world study the development of these brains. But in order to do that, we look at the embryos, the small bodies of all these organisms. And there is a one, one special comparison these developmental trajectories of all these species. Here I have we have laid out many species, which I will tell you, that all of their embryonic starts look very, very similar. Do you agree? 
this is the one state of development which is comparable across all these species. None of them are slightly ahead in time. Whoops. You can see, you can see these guys coming in this one kind of organism with these. Sorry, I heard someone here. Fish, okay. And you have these. Okay, keep guessing, keep guessing. Okay. Some say human beings, some say any other species. Mammals. Okay. okay. Here's the answer. You guys were right. This is fish. The person is like, actually, it's not on that side, but on this side. Here's a chicken, here's a hog, here's a calf. They are in the calf, they are looking spied, buffalo later. Here we are a rabbit, and here is a human embryo. It is at this stage that we study how the brain develops in these animals from right from here until here. So you can say that we are studying some other species because we cannot study human species ethically at the start for a long, long time with genetic manipulation. So we have to study some other species like the rabbit, the calf, or the hog. So, how to choose which species to study the brain of? Okay, let's start with some of the small animals which have some kind of a neurological structure of the brain. Uh, you guys might know, in order to do that, we just have to compare that species with ourselves and ask if that brain is useful to study in the context of disease or development in comparison with human brain. A normal human will be able to let's like, say, a human or a whose lifespan is 18 years, okay, we will have 20,000 genes and somewhere around 1 to 10 billion neurons in the whole brain. So that in TRFR, we, there are many neurobiological lines in TRFR and we study various species and I'm going to elucidate what is the importance or the speciality of each of these species. Let's start with a small one. This is a small worm, which is called C. elegans. Its, its weight is like 10 raised to minus 6 grams. You can say it lives about like 17 days. In 17 days, from one generation to the other, you can live. It has like 20,000 genes. So, okay, if you want to study genes in the brain, then you can study the species. Small, so we study the neural properties in these animals as well to understand how neurons function. So we need an organism which has a slightly bigger brain, maybe. So for that, we have the process of an alligator, or a form of a fly, similar to that. Its weight is just 100 times more than this, lifespan is 30 days, and you can have 15,000 genes in that. Okay, so like your genes, but it has more neurons, significantly more neurons. And on this scale of the axis, you can see how far these animals are from the humans on an evolutionary scale. And here is the gestational time, the time taken from one embryo to the other, because if it takes like 10 years to study it, then you won't finish a PhD. Okay, here we have another species called the zebrafish, and its weight is significantly higher than the previous one. It lives a long time, it lives up to almost three to five years. It has 26,000 genes, so good, lot of genes. And it has 10 raised to 7 neurons. A few rat neurons, that's also very good. But the choice of the most labs in the world to study the disease part of at least human development is the mouse. The mouse only weighs 20 grams. Its lifespan is up to 3 to 3 years. It has 22,000 genes. So significantly higher number of neurons than the zebrafish. And now we chose this algorithm to study what we want to look in the brain. And here's a case study that I will present to you that we put in our own lab. It's part of our work in Professor Shubhatuli's lab, our collaborators in the as well as in Croatia in Professor Lorenov's lab. So that we have to first understand how the mouse brain is built. This is an example of a mouse brain. Here is the start of the brain, that is the front of the brain, and this is the back of the brain. The structure that we are looking at here, does anyone know the name of the structure? This is the cerebellum, and this is somewhere, somewhere like you said. Sorry? Cerebrum. Yes, this is the cerebrum, or the cortex, or the neocortex of the brain, or the cortex rather, to be precise. And how is this brain, or how is this chosen to be the cortex from an animal that we saw previously, is by a simple morphogenic gradient. 
if, I wanted to imagine the French flag. You guys know the French flag. So if you have a right with blue in the middle the right, and the right side is red, you can similarly make things of things that can be spread in the brain by a few cells. Like those cells can be red and color is different with stuff starting from here. All these cells can be on this side, where you need to secrete these morphogen cells from this side, giving you a good. This is happening is extremely important because the way the brain is patterned is what these brain cells will do. Something like this. If you started to have a pattern that you start from this color, this brain region will become, let's say, for the time being, and perform some tasks. The brain that in the mouse is the most important part of one of the most important parts of the mouse surgery is the brain that senses the world. That is called S1 over here. The A1 region that comes possibly from this side is the auditory part from which the mouse can hear. And the V1 part is the, the visual part from which the mouse can see. So it is very important for these autonomy events to happen correctly for specifying various brain regions, and thereby the neurons that are done in those regions can be very, very fixed. We all know there are not just neurons in the brain. There is a liquid in which the brain flows. And we all know that liquid was possibly that you studied in school that is called the cerebrospinal fluid. It is the liquid that cools the brain, protects the brain from, from pressure and things like that, and also performs a function that it forms a barrier through which nutrition is passed across and your brain gets food from the brain. And apart from that, it also does weight clearing because this cerebrospinal fluid can be cleared and more can be got and so on and so forth. That makes the brain nourished, healthy, and functioning. But who makes cerebrospinal fluid? Structure called the thyroid plexus. In order to understand how the thyroid plexus itself comes in the brain, we have to first go into the mouse development pack. And here is a mouse brain. And if you look at the same brain taken as a photograph in my lab from Shubha's peer post, Dr. Hatem Saad, you can see there is a sliver of this. We, we color this for a certain gene. And this part of the brain is when you take a cut of the brain like this, you can see it, it secretes its factor. This factor is called in clear, but for the time being, let's just call it a factor. That comes from this very nice structure called the hem. The hem is like the edge of a skirt, you can, which has a fold like this. Similarly, the structure is kind of fold, so they call this the hem. This structure, the hem, secretes a factor that can pattern the tissue around it, and the thyroid plexus, which secretes the cerebrospinal fluid, comes from this structure. Now we asked, what if we changed? the factor that is coming to, as if to make it more that in fact is much of these factors not effective the effects of these factors i'm going to show you so, sorry uh, am i getting cut in between no problem i'm going to show you how that by changing the amount of this effective effectiveness of the factor by making it less or more we can in fact change the ability of the thyroid plexus to form. So here is what I showed you in the videos, but you would probably ask me, wait, 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 wait. does this happen also in the human? And the answer is yes. Here is a human brain at the same time of the mouse, like in the same stages, and here is the thyroid plexus of the human, which is gigantic. So this makes it very important for us to study why the thyroid plexus in the brain is there and why is it so big in the human? So we, did, we first ask, okay, so you said there is a factor. If that factor is secreted, how do you know does this factor goes into the coral plexus and affects it? We know by staining for this green color protein, which you can see in the structure, is abundantly present. And if this factor is affected, for example, you can measure 
plaques are measurement of this very similar in tissue called the plaque plexus, and we are measuring it by this protein called tetanin. And I'm just name this red color protein. Let us clearly see that this red color tetanin is there. It told us that the factor that is being secreted by the hand is going inside this cobalt plexus and is effective. Because we cannot take a human baby and perform these experiments, we did the next best thing. We did it in a mouse. In the mouse, it's perfectly fine to understand how the structure of the cobalt plexus emerges. So, in order to do that, we use a few genetic tools that are very common that can be done in our labs, which are like cutting edge labs in the world. And here is how we do it. If you have to perform this complex structure here, we can use a genetic trick by which we can make this complex brighter, as you can see. And if you can see the right thing there, yeah. so in the same way, you can look or take out genes only from this structure in the developing brain and ask, thus removing this gene or cure this gene affect the complex development. And I'm going to show you that the more put it out is going to affect the structure. So we we'll call this signaling system, the signaling team, we call it wind signaling, and we are going to disrupt it or make it less or more by doing some genetic tricks. This is called we'll call it determining LOS, loss of function, which is what it stands for. And what if you take a nice controlled normal mouse brain, this complex structure, not here in this violet blue color, looks like a nice thin ribbon. And if you remove the determinant, it decreases the signal that was coming out from the start. What can you see? It's not thin and nice. In fact, it becomes all crumbled, just like all of us crumble inside the Mumbai locals, not organized, but still effectively crumble together. Now, this affects not only the structure visually, but this complex is supposed to secrete the cerebrospinal field, for which, for it needs this green color protein and this red color protein, nicely at the edges of the complexes, and look in the beta pigment loss function, by which we have decreased the signal, now as being this green protein has now is there. The red protein that is supposed to be there, it's a water channel so to go out and come in. It's not there. Suggesting that the process function is assaulted in this, in this reduced signaling brains. You must be okay. You decrease the signaling. But what if you put the signaling more? What if you have more of the signaling? What will happen? So we did that. So that We'll take again the beta technique protein and we'll now call it GOS, gain of function, negative to By what we realized, here is again the mouse brain. The control is the normal right type brain, normal mouse brains at a certain time in the development. You can see this color, this color is this nice, thin, and ribbon like. But look, in the gain of function now, this seems to be the And this ability of sequencing this tissue, you can say whatever is happening in the tissue. If the tissue is down, if the tissue is becoming cancerous, if the tissue is normal, and if the tissue is not normal. So here's a graph that says that this tissue that is here normally ends up over here. But when you go, the signal, the function, 
tissue submerged of a sequence of the to the left, which is like some other structure in the brain, which may be neurons. So, we have neurons, neurons are coming up. So, if you check all the genes that make up the genetic process, which is required to see a spider, all the genes of that go down. And if the genes that are between the neurons start coming up, and here's some example. So, normally, the complex is this which has the number of and then function. Cells, it's something that's a good and red color, Okay, this one and it is like this happens in the human. How do you know that if we take this baby because it's more in the humans, the same will happen? So for that, we took uh, we took advantage of we took advantage of one of the newest and cutting edge research that is coming up, which is building organoids. Organoids are nothing but new cells that you can take, put them in a dish, grow them for many, many, many days with certain amount of factors that can give them a brain like structure. This happened in Professor Audley Rhino's lab, and my colleague Arthur, who led this project with me, went and did this. So now we were able to grow brain human mini brains inside the tube. And in this, we wanted to ask, is there a choroid plexus? Yes, the red protein that we were looking previously is there in all of them. And when we change the signaling again, we put more of a signal, the red protein also went out. We did this over in like how you put masala in your food, a little less masala, less spicy, thoda medium masala, medium spicy, and lower spice. So as just like you increase spice, if you increase the signaling that we spoke about at the start of it, you, you can titrate. We call this the process of titration. You can put little, little, little or more, and you can see the effect that the choroid plexus identity or the choroid plexus identity which puts out the CSF is now decreasing over time, suggesting that the signaling that you were told is important to make this choroid plexus is not only important in the mouse, but also very, very, very important in the human. All right. Okay. You found one thing about choroid plexus, which makes the human brain tick, it protects it and all that. We are not just interested in that. We're interested in how the neurons control function and behavior. How many of you think that all our behaviors is in the brain, that we can change a neuron and then change a behavior? Does anyone think that? Hands up. Come on. Let's see a show of hands. Okay, yeah, one guy thinks that, or there are some people who think that. So you think that if you change some neurons in the brain, you can change your behavior? Yeah, let, let's say somebody is very angry. We change some neurons and I'm less angry. Okay, something like that. Okay, how many of you think that the behavior such as eating food or drinking water is all in the neurons? No? Okay, you think that, huh? Okay. And I'm going to show you that it is in the case. That there's a structure, not in the cerebral cortex, but much below, which is called the hypothalamus in the mouse. So what researchers did in 10 years ago is that they found neurons that were, again, coming out of patterning and development that they thought was important for feeding behavior of mice. So what you can do is you can inject an electrode or an optical fiber and do some genetic tricks and make that neuron green in color and all that. Yep, you can see, and you can inject this electrode and shine blue light or green light, whatever kind of light that will activate a neuron or stop a neuron. So, a neuron, and for let's say me doing this action, and now if you start 
it on, I'll keep doing this. Okay? And if I'm doing this and I stop that neuron, stop. Sounds like science fiction. Really? Okay. Let's look. This is a mouse. This mouse is well fed. Okay? It has electrodes into that hypothalamus region where we think is the neuron that makes mice eat. Eat fatty foods. Eat McGur. Although this is not McDonald's burger, it's some kind of fatty food. But the mouse is well fed. And when a light, you can see this part stuck to its head. If a light turns on, you're activating the neurons that we think are for important for the feeding behavior, that control the feeding behavior. This mouse is well fed. So you think it will eat more? No, right? It's full. It's belly full. Okay? And I'm going to show you what happens. Okay? Mouse doesn't want to eat. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Green light, 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 light. Start eat, start eat, start eat, start eat, start eat, start eat. Full, full belly mouse starts to eat. Lights on, lights on, eating, lights on, eating. Off. Stops eating. Wait, wait, wait. Don't believe me? We'll do it once more. Not eating, not eating, not eating. Start. Light start, light start. Starts eating. Researchers also did the other experiments where a mouse was super hungry. Now they connected this electrodes to a neuron that stops eating behavior. Even though the food was there, the mouse wouldn't eat because these neurons were stopped. That means these neurons that control the feeding behavior were off and the mouse will not eat. Neuroscience research has come a long way in other structures, such as hypothalamus, for our feeding behavior, our ability to be angry, our ability to feel fear, our ability to, to feel pain. Yet, there are some very specific abilities that only humans possess. So, why don't we not just study humans? There are many challenges in understanding a human brain functions. And the reasons for that are going to be the topic of our next discussion. But wait, what about other species? Is our brain any special than them? No, it's not. If you take a monkey brain, it may be smaller in size or a chimpanzee's brain, but it's equivalent to its body's proportion. So there must be some very, very specific changes in specific parts of the human brain that makes it. Okay. What makes one is the number of neurons. So how do we get more neurons than the monkey brain or the mouse brain? The answer is in the, in the stem cells. So if you imagine this black dot to be a mouse stem cell, and it has to make a lot of neurons, but it's only one stem cell. So what it does, it makes two copies of itself. And one of the copies of this stem cell gives rise to some other two types, two orange balls or two orange dots which then make more neurons. So effectively from one, you got four here. And if you go down this road, you'll get another four. So for from one to two to two four, and this process keeps on repeating in the mouse and you get a lot of millions of neurons. But wait, what happens in the human is that you not only get one black, you also get another black, which gives rise to a green ball. Now this green ball gives, this one again becomes a black and this green ball gives rise to one pink ball. But wait, one more green ball, one pink ball, one more green ball. And this process keeps on repeating for n numbers of times until this. So at the end of this division, you had four, one to four. But at the end of this division, you have one to six and yet another one. So this keeps on repeating. And that's why we have more neurons. But wait, we don't have neurons more in all the structures, but in very specific structures. And why do we have more neurons is because of this gene called RGAP11D, where you can see if you take a normal mouse brain, it, it is nice and smooth everywhere. But if you put more of this gene, especially in one part of the brain, you get slightly more neurons. And if you have more neurons, things start to fold upon themselves. Or in, in this case, there's a bulge because of the lack of space. And if you do the same in the marmoset brain, the marmoset is a monkey. You still have more neurons. And again, you have a bulge very similar to this. 
And this was shown by Professor Whelan Hutner and his colleagues and Professor Savante Pablo's lab. Uh, we also found another gene, which is called the TKTL1, doesn't matter, just names. In which there is a small mutation, which makes this process of having the pink balls that we saw in the previous slide, they normally go like this. But if you have this gene, instead of one pink ball, you will have two, four, six, eight, and increased. And this increase is exactly what makes more neurons in the human brain. And this brain, number of more neurons, is not high just in this part of the, it's, just, it's not high in every part of the brain, but just in the front part of the brain. The front part of this brain is called prefrontal cortex, PFC-like. Look at the mouse PFC, which is very small, pink, drawn to scale. Look at the human prefrontal cortex, which is so huge, so huge than the mouse that it has so many more neurons. We believe that it is the prefrontal cortex that is important for social behaviors. That's important for many human-like behaviors through which we get our intellect and we become human merely by having more connections over there. And these connections have to be met with strong connections across the brain. So this part of the brain, the free parental cortex, has to be connected to all parts of the brain with more neurons. And this happens in the mouse. If you see these connections, they are very well established. But in the humans, you just have more of them. How is so? Here is a mouse brain, a prefrontal cortex neuron of the mouse. You can see the number of fibers. Each fiber is connected to another neuron. And more neurons connected to other, this part as well. You can see each of these, we call them, uh, we, uh, we call them spines in the neurons. But you can see the number of spines in the, in the human compared to a mouse also increases. Suggesting that the pre humans is much more connected to other parts. You'll ask me, okay, why? Okay, what? So what? We have more connections in one part of the brain. Does that affect our daily lives? The answer is yes. It's very important to study these neurons of the prefrontal cortex because emerging evidence in research from all across the world suggests <laughs> that many human conditions such as ADHD, schizophrenia, intellectual disability, and perhaps the mother of all neurodevelopmental disorders, the autism spectrum disorders, all have a originating or a unbiased or a biased effect on the prefrontal cortex, which is very high humans, thereby giving us some neurodevelopmental diseases. And if we were to tackle these diseases or to understand these diseases at the very basics, we have to study the prefrontal cortex in the mouse as well as in the humans to understand how these are made and what went wrong in the first place. Uh, that would be all for building blocks of brain. This is my whole team here at TIFR. I'm very glad to be a part of this team. This is Professor Shubatole, who was there sometime in the audience. Professor Orly Reiner, with whom we did the mini brains in the dish experiments. Arpan, who led that work with me and many other colleagues and uh, uh, who I've been very, very happy to work with. Very, I thank the TIFR outreach team members for always setting up such a wonderful day at the National Science Day. And I wish you all of you a very good afternoon and happy Science Day once again. Thank you so much. Uh, I will now take questions, right? Yes, there are questions. So uh, the floor is open for questions, please. Uh, there are no stupid questions, so please ask any question that you feel like asking. Okay, you have a question. Thanks for starting up. Elephants are larger than us, right? So the elephants will have a larger brain than yeah. So, uh, so they will have larger, more neurons as well. Yeah. So then, why are they smarter than uh, if if this these things were? So they are they having less neural connections? Oh, fantastic question. It's a matter of great debate whether great whales or you know big whales and elephants, which have like proportionally larger brains than us, do they have anything? First, the knowledge on that is limited because it's ethically very, very, very hard to get an elephant brain. Okay. 
if I have to carry a mouse brain, I can carry a hundred in this palm. If I have to carry a human brain, maybe I carry a fetal human brain, I carry it in this. If I have to carry a elephant brain, it's so big. So research becomes very difficult to do that. Ethically, it's very inconsiderate to go into elephant brains unless we have a very specific question. But that, I'll give you a moment now, nuanced understanding question. We don't believe that the elephants are like less smart than us or something like that. But we believe that the elephant's lifespan and the elephant's evolutionary trajectory is significantly away from the human trajectory, from the primate trajectory, that maybe makes it less susceptible to diseases. Also, I have to concede that we do not study elephant behavior at all, or to very little extent, in, uh, as opposed to a primate or a rodent behavior, because it's simply not possible to take elephants and keep them in a cage. It's simply not ethical as well. So we do not know to a large extent why the elephants are different, and we do not know how different they are in the first place. Apart from some morphological understanding from a very few studies. Right. Yeah. There's a question there. Uh, sir, uh, you had a very good talk. Thank you. Uh, so you mentioned uh, choroid plexus, right? So it's supporting the uh, neuron neurons by supplying yes. nutrients. So I had one question that you uh, targeted how the neurons are building up, how many neurons are increasing. But uh, is there any relevance for the supporting cells like the neuroglia? Uh, so, so sorry, can I come again? Neuroglia, okay. the supporting cells. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they also help the neurons uh, shape the neural connection. Yes, yes. So is there any significance for that in study? Exceptional like question. Yes, the answer is yes. In today, we believe that the support cells, which are called glia, which are like 10 times more than the neuron in the brain, also have an effect in development and they affect the ability, individual's ability or susceptible to disease or less susceptible to disease in case of Alzheimer's and so on and so forth. Because the support cell makes sure that the neuron lives and function properly over time, if they are affected somehow, the neurons are affected by and large and the individual can suffer from various diseases. Yes, there's a growing body of work in that. I'll be happy to speak with you later in the break more about that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, further questions? Feel free to ask for anything, if even if it doesn't have to be. Uh, so, uh, I'll close the box question. Where can I have a career brain that wants to be in the field of neuroscience? And if I want to pursue my career, like where are my options for research? And that's what all the finance might do. Okay, fantastic question. So, I hear Tesla is hiring. They are hiring engineers to build artificial neural networks, neural networks which are there, but that's a very cheesy answer. Okay. <laughs> if you talk about normal, like normal jobs or people who want a nice, stable job, a lot of neuroscience research is very important for pharma companies because if there are pharma companies that are building drugs against, let's say, Alzheimer's or progression of Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, uh, I would like you to watch a movie called Awakenings in which Robert De Niro acts and they, they found a drug called L-Dopa and how it changed some understanding and some real people made a ton of money out of it because of one simple chemical research of L-Dopa. Okay, so there is tons of opportunities in pharma industry and in other industries. So you can get a basic neuroscience degree and apply to the jobs there. You can get a basic biology degree and apply to jobs over there. So being a cell biology student, how should I focus on these opportunities that you are targeting to? Uh, so this requires a large answer, but I will try to be brief. If you understand cell biology in the best possible way, according to you, you will see the openings that, that are there for research, not just fundamental basic research, but also applied research. So pharma companies often take out ads saying that we need cell balance for this, we need cell balance for that. Keep looking at LinkedIn and right. talk to your peers who are there, your seniors at Pfizer, maybe some of the big companies, they might know better. So it's about connections and understanding what is the need and how you can fit in that role. Right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Do we, I saw some other hand there. Yeah, that's there, there's a question there. 
Oh, a lot of time, so I can take more questions. Hello, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just uh, you mentioned about autism, sir, and uh, uh, the pattern of that neurons, number of neurons, how it affects exactly and what exactly causes uh, that uh, autism. Would you please uh, flash a little light over that? Okay, excellent question. This is a matter. So uh, we don't understand autism very well at all. We understand autism very well. All right. One of the things that we know that uh, if I can go back to yeah, please. slides back. Yeah. So if you see, uh, can you see these connections? In autism, the way these connections are formed or the number of these spines, the number of these triangles, which are like three or four here, but six or seven here, these numbers are affected surely in autism in very specific neurons, in very specific areas of the brain. Why, why, why does it become less, more, or its shape changes? We don't understand. We don't know why that happens. But the basic understanding of us that is so far is that in autism, these connections that are supposed to be normal from one to one, let's say a neuron connects to another neuron and there's another neuron coming to connect to both of them. Now, suddenly one of the wires is severed or one of the wires never formed. We don't know why it never forms. That is the matter of ongoing research. But what we know is that if you have 100 connections and you made it 60 or you made it 120, that can be a score of how autism, how bad the autism is in the first place. That could be one of the ways to look at it. Does fine. that answer your question? Fine, fine. So can it be controlled anyway? Or oh, I mean, is it preventive? Ah, it's a very, very, very hard question. People are trying that in the mouse with very little success because if somebody is, let's say, predisposed to some kind of autism, how will you intervene inside the brain? without affecting other structures. So let's say you give a drug that makes connections grow faster, but it caused the connection to grow faster here and things got wrong in the cerebellum. So the individual will suffer from other parts. So right now we simply lack the understanding and the ability to intervene. But the first to understand itself, what went wrong is the first. So that will be. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sir. <laughs> Sir, uh, you have shown a slide here. Yeah. Uh, you have uh, shown a slide in which the brain was grown, no? the yeah. mini brain. Yeah. Actually, we learned that the neurons cannot divide. Then, how this uh, could you explain the process a bit? So, what happens in this? Uh, we are not we are not dividing neurons. This one, right? Uh -huh. The you take stem cells, stem, you take skin cells, you make them to stem cells, you make those stem cells become neural stem cells, and these neural stem cells divide and give you more neuron. So when you come to this part of the talk, uh, you see this. Imagine each black ball is a neural stem cell, which gives rise to more neural stem cells, and this part is another neural stem cell. These cells divide and give you neurons. These pink balls, which are neurons, don't divide. How did you identify these neural stems? We didn't. Like a lot of scientists did many years ago. So there are some basic proteins that are there in all stem cells. The 2008 human uh, Nobel Prize was to figure out four such factors. They are called Yamanaka factors, named after the scientist who discovered them. So that scientist and group, his colleagues, his group, his students, his postdocs, and all of them came to the conclusion that if you put four factors, let's call them factors at the moment, if you put them very much inside a tissue, if you make them more in a stem in a cell, it becomes a stem cell. So you can take skin cells, make them into stem cells in the dish, and make those stem cells into neural stem cells and further into neurons, and you can see how that neuron is different. All of autism, schizophrenia, and other of other diseases that we I spoke about, everyone started studying with these techniques. Okay, there, it's called stem cell technology. It's one of the most used technologies in the current research world of biology. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have another. So we have time for at least uh, one or two more questions. So you have showed that the experiment, the mouse experiment. Can you, can you please? Uh, I don't think so. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. 
So you saw that the mouse experiment, giving the signal to eat or not to eat, right? And if you keep doing these things for many days, you know, what will it will affect to the, the mouse uh, and what will it do to the other neurons? Excellent like, question. Don't know people are looking at it. So with, if you do something repeatedly, yes, some connections of brain start getting stronger, start or weaken and so on and so forth. I, to the best of my knowledge, I don't know of any studies that did that, that artificially start a neuron and see how the other neurons are behaving. It's a matter of ongoing research, but the answer is not fully known. But in, the, in that experiment, yeah. there are two part of the question. In that experiment, if you keep doing it, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not sure if you have done or not, then what will be the effect that a, the mouse will die or if she keep he, if the mouse keep eating? Yes, if the mouse keep eating, it will get obese and if the, the, the disease of the obesity obviously will happen. But these are not done the way you're saying it or like or you're thinking. These are done for very specific times for very specific instances. Possibly that there must be ethical consideration that we will do it only 10 times, record it and stop. Because we are not here to affect mouse or we are not here to make the mouse's life difficult if it is not a research question. So they don't do this experiment involuntarily. They are done in with very, very, very strict ethical considerations. So after this experiment, the mouse would have been kept normally with its other peoples until it is sacrificed or it dies or whatever was the ethical approval of that particular experiment. So we don't do this experiment forcefully on the mice to an extent that it will die during the process. We don't aim to do that, at least. And on, on that part, so... Can you speak on the mice? Yeah. That so time? on that part, uh, I mean, if we think about that after 20 years or 25 years, that experiment will develop in certain way. So if I imagine that things, probably human will put some helmet things, right? And it will put the some kind of diodes over there and they can be more intelligent, right? And mm. they can give like, like you are doing the research, right? It, it will give some time to get some output. But if we get more pupil with some kind of helmet, then we will be faster than the race of the, the human beings. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, but those are very, very, very uh, science fiction uh, themed things that- This is the beginning, right? This is That's the beginning. That but there is a wide body of ethical considerations that are there before you can even do this in a month. Forget, forget us that people are now doing this in a monkey and there's a wide ethical backlash against that, whether we should do this. People did this to prove that we can find the neuron that is important for the behavior of eating. That doesn't mean we want to take this and control other human beings. No, that is not why the aim of this. If somebody wants to use it for that, yes, obviously they can, but there will be a there is a body of ethical scientists who actively are trying not to let this happen. Thank you. It's a nice presentation. Thank you. Great. Uh, we have time for one last question. Um, with that, we will sort of close this session. Anyone with any curiosity that they would like to address? I have, uh, a, I have a question to him or to his question regarding this mouse uh, experiment. So you said that basic functions like eating, probably you could induce uh, such behavior. Can you induce- Can you give me a bit loud? Yes, sorry. So can you induce uh, other behaviors like uh, running fast for a mouse using uh, these things or only eating this sort of basic behavior? If you find the neuron circuitry for that, you can do anything. We know it for drinking disorders. We know it for aggression. We know it for eating or sex. We know the exact neurons and the, all these neurons are found in the hypothalamus, which is a part of the study. So if you can identify the neuron that is, in, in, is involved or the neuron that makes this action happen, you can, in theory, you should be able to do it for every action, in theory. Right. Uh, thank you for the amazing talk. Thank you for the questions. So I'll be closing this session right now. However, there's a, a public lecture by the director of the institute in 20 minutes from now from 3.30. I hope you'd come in. And, okay, this works. <laughs> so, as I was saying, there's a public lecture from 3.30 and so we can listen to the universe with a big telescope that is in Kodan, not too far from here. And we join in at that point. We have a break of about 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you.